Good afternoon, colleagues and friends, and welcome to the faculty convocation. Traditionally, we begin the program with the singing of the Star Spangled Banner. Singing the national anthem this afternoon is Seton Hall University student, Ella Small, who is a diplomacy and social work major. After the singing of the national anthem, Father Brian Musis, assistant professor in the School of Diplomacy and International Relations will deliver the invocation. Let us place ourselves in the spirit of prayer. O oh God, the members of the human family address you by different names and in different ways. I will address you in the Catholic manner. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, at the beginning of this new academic year, as we come before you full of thoughts and feelings, intimations and expectations, fears and hopes, we recall your words of comfort and assurance. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Loving God, this beginning is totally new for some of us, especially many of our students. Turn the sadness of leaving family and familiarity into the gladness of new friends and opportunities. Turn anxiety about academics into quiet confidence in your guidance. For all of us, we have never begun a school year in an environment quite like this one. Open our eyes and minds to see and understand our own good and the good of our neighbor. Renew our perspectives that we may see people, circumstances, events, and academic work as invitations to develop the many gifts you have given us to be used in service of others, that they and we may experience success, health, and growth. Faithful God, some in our community are in their final year at Seton Hall University. Bless them with gratitude for the friends they have made, with wonder for the way their minds and hearts have been changed, and with hope for the opportunities that lie ahead. Gracious God, bless each member of the Seton Hall University community with the seven gifts of your Holy Spirit, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and piety and reverence. And so joining our hearts, minds and spirits, we pray direct, O Lord, all our actions by your holy inspiration and carry them on by your gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may always begin with you 
and by you be happily ended through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Ella and Father Brian. President Nair, Provost Passerini, Dr. Farina, Dr. Knight, newly promoted faculty and colleagues, welcome to our annual faculty convocation. My name is Richard Winchester, associate professor from the law school. And it is my pleasure to convene us all here today as we recognize faculty accomplishments and in a very special way, welcome new faculty. This afternoon, we celebrate the bonds that join us together and share in the renewed energy and excitement as we begin a new academic year. Let us begin. To present the necrology, I would like to welcome Dr. Beth Jameson, Assistant Professor from the College of Nursing. Remembering our deceased colleagues. Dr. Janine P. Buckner, Department of Psychology, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Planning in the College of Arts and Science. Dr. Nicholas D. D. Prospo, Founding Dean, School of Graduate Medical Education, now our School of Health and Medical Sciences. Reverend John F. Morley, Department of Religion. Dr. John J. Sackerman, Professor Emeritus, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. Dr. Robert Shapiro, Department of Accounting and Taxation. Dr. Charles Yen, Professor Emeritus, University Libraries. Thank you, Dr. Jameson. It is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Faculty Senate and invite him to say a few words. Dr. Jonathan Farina is the chair of the Faculty Senate and an associate professor in the English department. Dr. Farina. Welcome back, colleagues, and a special welcome to our new faculty. We are lucky to have you. I congratulate those of you who've been tenured and promoted as one of the least, uh, at least two people at Seton Hall who think we should wear our academic regalia every week, I earnestly regret that you do not have the chance to celebrate with us in your new gowns. I trust you're wearing them at home as I do. This week, I've been teaching Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. It is an exquisite novel, dramatic irony and sarcasm, caricature and realism, tea drinking, long walks, gossip, a sassy protagonist, Elizabeth, and a brooding love interest, Darcy all things that I love. That said, the novel is also the product and the representation of a deeply troubled world. At the turn of the 19th century, novel readers, novels, and the tea drinking and great houses they describe were only possible because of the enormous wealth generated by the slave trade, colonial exploitation, and a class system that maintained terrific economic and social inequity. Austin ignores almost the entire working class, except for a few shopkeepers, lawyers, and shop owners, because, because they are useful props for the plot of the affluent. If Pride and Prejudice is progressive in its portrayal of women circa 1800, it is still nevertheless sexist, and Darcy's convention-breaking desire for Elizabeth only camouflages her real impetus to marry, financial security, and prestige. But still, I love the novel. 
In class, I discuss all these sordid aspects of Pride and Prejudice, not only because they intersect with the interests of my students, but also because they are the truth. Pride and Prejudice represents the world selectively, ignoring and glossing over sometimes terrible realities and embracing others. Honestly knowing the novel and the culture it represents requires that we recognize the people it does not represent and those inequities it reinforces or complacently accepts. But we do not stop reading or enjoying the novel because of these shameful flaws or its shamefully flawed culture. If we are to be and to teach our students to become proactive citizens and allies in making a better world, we need to be critical even of the things and the people we love. And we need to be able to forgive and love the things we critique. Critical thinking has purpose. It is a form of care. I talk about critiquing Austin here partly to remind us all that we need to demonstrate the ways our subjects intersect with and inform the concerns of our students and their world. And that we need to remember to critique even what we love precisely because we love it. But I also talk about critiquing Austin because I am sick of hearing the lament that faculty in general are always too critical or negative, and that the annual convocation remarks of the Senate in particular ought to be inspirational and positive. Faculty are no more interested in teaching complacency than I am interested in inspiring it. I am interested in change. We have faculty who deeply like and faculty who unequivocally love Seton Hall, yet none do so under the delusion that it is flawless. Most faculty here are genuinely grateful to Seton Hall for the opportunity and community it affords us, but we are sometimes nonetheless as ashamed of it as I am with the novels I love and teach. As it happens, blushes first and frequently betray Elizabeth's unconscious attraction to Mr. Darcy, as blushes have betrayed so many of us with the Mr. Darcy's in our lives. Elizabeth blushes because of how her obnoxious mother behaves in front of him. She blushes because she cares for both her family, tacky and flawed as they are, and for Darcy, snobbish as he is. Let our annual blushes, fostered by our convocation marks, remarks, and by all of our critical exchanges, remind us that critique is a form of care, and that silence, agreement, and gratuitous self-congratulation are more often than not forms of carelessness. No speech could magically make this crazy semester all A pluses and fresh apples on the desk. And we can't eat it in the classrooms anyway, so put away your apple and take the pledge. Remote, now high flex, then who knows what. With masks on and plexiglass up, this semester will be extraordinarily trying on our patients and on our nerves. We are fortunate to have so many flexible, resilient, intelligent, and caring colleagues among us. No matter how, we will teach them engagingly and with care. Even without the pandemic, however, universities face lots of challenges. Let's face them openly, directly, honestly, and aggressively. No complacency, no fear of taking the risks necessary to redress what makes us ashamed. So what makes me ashamed? This past year, Seton Hall made substantial progress adjusting the proportion of money it spends on instruction relative to administration and other non-instructional costs. But we still spend way too little of the budget per student on instruction. Seton Hall still makes far too many decisions based on enrollments rather than a clear academic vision. Call me Elizabeth Bennett, I blush at that. We need to decide what curricula we prescribe for our students and to make our decisions based on how best to provide those curricula with the highest quality we can afford. We need to evaluate faculty based on the quality of the contributions they make to that education as scholars and as teachers, rather than the number of majors or students in their classes at a given time. Seton Hall also has way too many colleges and programs relative to its resources and size. And so every academic program is underfunded. We are not married to Darcy and we know it, but we haven't done anything about it. So I'm blushing from my bosom to my bonnet. But blushing is transformational in Pride and Prejudice. Embarrassment accompanies the increasing self-awareness and social success of its principal characters. The most transformational moment of the novel comes when Elizabeth reads and rereads Darcy's explanation of the wi villain Wickham's deceitful scheming. She then experiences feelings 
more acutely painful and difficult of definition, as Austin says, astonishment, apprehension, and even horror. That's about how I felt this week when I read and reread the adversarial, defensive, distracting, and legalistic response to the faculty's request for a more flexible, reasonable, and compassionate approach to adjustments. If we treat each other as adversaries, we undermine the idea of a university, and needless to say, we ruin our prospects for marrying up. But shame and horror such as this enable Elizabeth to realize what and whom she actually loves, and it can do the same for us. We need to reset and move on with greater transparency, compassion, and shared decisions that respect what we are as an academic institution. We have much to be hopeful for as we begin to address our challenges. Last year, we all participated in the composition of a strategic plan that the Board of Regents will vote upon next month. I thank Andy Simon and Alyssa McLeod for their excellent work co-chairing that inclusive process. Part of the strategic plan calls for us to foster a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable campus culture. And the university is already implementing that goal with a collaborative cross-functional team. I trust we will all contribute to that effort in and out of class, whether we are on the DEI committees or not. The plan also calls for us to provide a distinctive and rigorous education in the liberal arts tradition that also informs curated professional and graduate programs. To be clear, curated does not mean and cannot mean hoarded. We need to decide what we are not going to do and to reinvest in teaching integrated liberal arts and select professional and graduate programs really well. Getting by with further across the board financial cuts to everything and everyone would preserve only the same underachievement and adversarial silos that hamper us now. So we need to decide what curricular offerings and classes are most necessary to the education we have imagined. And then we need to reorganize the colleges to create the most efficient structure for providing that curriculum with genuine quality. We cannot sustain graduate programs where we do not have the depth and caliber of faculty or the student demand to be competitive. We need to shed some programs based on our academic vision and in so doing, we need to be mindful that classes and faculty members are valuable even if they are not part of a major or a minor or an entire department. Liberally educated students need serious coursework in music and drama, religion, classics, art, languages, math, and more, even if they are not majoring in them. We can be creative organizing fields where we cannot afford whole departments, but we must insist upon teaching all of these disciplines including most especially our core with qualified research active scholars and engaging teachers with the same opportunities for tenure as those in popular majors. We need to teach students why our subjects matter and to demonstrate that they matter to us by investing in them. We need to avoid transforming into a place that only teaches what students think they need to know and instead teach students what will prepare them for a future that they cannot predict. Our strategic plan says we aspire to provide all students the education to become adaptable, imaginative, resilient, ethical, and successful individuals. That won't happen by accident. We need to teach those dispositions and skills intentionally. And doing so starts by practicing these qualities as an institution. Let's together be imaginative, resilient, ethical, and successful. Like Elizabeth Bennett, Let's embrace our shame as an agent of self-awareness and maturation. Let's care by being honest and self-critical. Let's realize the plan we have crafted so that we emerge from the pandemic as a more efficiently organized and collaborative, higher quality and happier university. Stay safe, everybody, and go Pirates. Thank you, Dr. Farina. We are fortunate this afternoon to welcome our new provost as our keynote speaker. Dr. Katia Passerini joined Seton Hall on June 5 of this year as provost and executive vice president. Prior to coming to Seton Hall, Dr. Passerini was the Leslie H. and William L. Collins Distinguished Chair and Dean of the Collins College of Professional Studies at St. John's University 
where she also held a professor appointment in the Division of Computer Science, Mathematics, and Science. Dr. Perserini was the Herbert Chair and Professor of Management Information Systems at the Martin Tuckman School of Management, New Jersey Institute of Technology. She held a joint appointment in the Information Systems Department in the College of Computing Sciences. She served as Dean for the Albert Dorman Honors College. Dr. Perserini's extensive bio is in the faculty convocation program. To say that Dr. Passerini's tenure at Seton Hall has begun in the most trying of times would be an understatement, but she has risen to the challenges and continues to do so on a daily basis. Let us welcome today's keynote speaker, Provost Katia Passerini. Thank you. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Dear faculty, this is a great day for many of us. For some of you, the first conv convocation. Actually, for me too, it's the first convocation at Sidon Hall. For many others, especially the newly promoted faculty, one of the many that you have attended and will continue to attend. This is a day of joy, hope, and restart. Yes, we are restarting today in the middle of what we know and we do not know yet. Full of hopes, but also full of trepidations. Even if I've been teaching 17 years, the first day of in-person classes was always nerve wracking for me. And I suspect it's for many of us today. I will not be long in my remarks as I wish to yield my time to the many people that we are here to celebrate and recognize today. But I just wish to share a poem, rather a, a fable. One of Aesop's fables, the Greek narrator who has captured our imagination for centuries with its short metaphors. It goes like this. In a field one summer's day, a grasshopper was hopping about, chirping and singing to its heart content. An ant passed by, bearing along with great toil, an ear of corn he was taking to the nest. Why not come and chat with me, said the grasshopper, instead of toiling and mauling in that way. I'm helping to lay food for the winter, said the ant, and recommend that you do the same. Why bother about winter, said the grasshopper. We've got plenty of food at present. But the ant went on and continued its toil. When the winter came, the grasshopper had no food, while it saw the ants distributing the corn and grain they had collected in the summer. Then the grasshopper knew it is best to prepare for the days of necessity. This is what we have done. This is what Seton Hall University has done during the summer. We prepared for our restart. We prepared for a safe reopening. And we work very hard to be here for the days and years ahead of us. You are here today because you have prepared for the winter. You have worked very hard and achieved your deserved promotion to full professor, tenure, and promotion to associate professor, or have achieved the distinguished status of emeritus faculty, or the awards that will be conferred today. For our new faculty, you've also prepared for, for this moment, this new start. And I encourage you to reach out to the colleagues you see in the program book, because they might be your future mentors. They might be those guiding you through your journey while you work to prepare for your future at Seton Hall. 
Unfortunately, our immediate future seems one of, of those days of necessity, one of, of those difficult days where no matter how much we are prepared, like the ant, there is always going to be an unknown, something that we will need to be ready to deal with, with new solutions and new vigor. The uncertainty of the future is daunting. No matter how hard we are prepared, it is difficult to deal with unknowns. Yesterday, the College of Arts and Science remembered a faculty member who had been at Sino Hall for 20 years. I did not have the privilege to meet Janine Buckner, but seeing how she prepared her colleagues for a transition, recording a video to say goodbye, shows how closely connected this institution fundamentally is. Despite its differences, it creates communities. It builds friendships and relationships that will be here forever, even in the most difficult moments of transition. I know that many of our colleagues were not prepared for an untimely departure. But so, how do you prepare for the future? How do you work like the ant to be ready for the days of necessity? You do your best every day. You do your best in the classroom. You do your best in your research. You do your best with any encounter and any interaction you have. I would like to encourage all of us to try to do our best to prepare for the future because it is only by working like the ant that we will be ready. I did not know Dr. Buckner, but I read one of her emails when she announced their leave. And I was astonished because she was still giving directions and organizing things for her colleagues on her last day at work. I remember thinking, wow, she's a wonder woman. In the face of fear, she's still so focused on Sidon Hall, working like the ant to prepare for the winter. And this is what Sidon Hall is for those of you that are joining today, you will, you will know soon what this means. And for the many of you who have been here for a very long time, there is nothing that I, I can tell you about our community. You know it already. We are a lively and critical community. I thank you for the opportunity to serve as your provost. I too have been working like an aunt to prepare for this day and for this position. And I look forward to continuing to work hard with you as you go through your journey as a new professor or as you, con or you continue through your scholarly journey as an associate and full professor or you as you continue to represent Seton Hall proudly as an emeritus professor. There is another fable similar to the one that I read today. It's from the Italian poet Trilussa. Carlo Alberto Mariano Sallustri. He lived at the end of the 19th century. It is inspired on Aesop's fables, but it carries a rather different moral than the one we just heard. It's a little sarcastic, as Trilusta used satire in his sonnets to diffuse many difficult situations and dispense a lighter moral view than some of our Aesop's fables. Maybe one day, we can read that fable together. It's called La Cicale e la Formica, the hunt and the grasshopper. Together, in its original form, the Roman dialect that I proudly speak. I know that many students in the whole will understand that dialect as I've been surrounded by many colleagues who studied in Rome at the Gregorian University. And they meet me in Italian as I walk through the campus or join team meet teams meetings. It's beautiful to hear and see the cultural diversity of our community. I look forward to the day when we can use the green to be back together and maybe even read poetry and engage in new conversations. We are prepared for our return. And we're ready to reap the fruit of the hard work that we did over the summer like the ant, that work that will enable us 
to have a successful restart. Thank you and welcome back. Thank you, Provost Passerini. I'm now pleased to introduce the 21st president of Seton Hall, Dr. Joseph Nyer. Dr. Nyer is a naval, uh, a U.S. Naval veteran and a first generation college graduate who obtained three advanced degrees and completed pre and post doctoral studies at the University of Missouri um, University of Kansas and Harvard Medical School. He has served as a psychology professor in a, fac in a faculty capacity at several prominent universities. He has been recognized nationally for his program of research for attaining a stunning $60 million in research and service grants, authoring vital state and national legislation and building a system of care in Illinois that serves more than 30,000 people each year. Before coming to Seton Hall, he served as the president of Iona College for eight years. Dr. Nair is a student-focused president. Students come to know him because he is active in their lives, and faculty come to know him because he engages them in strategy. Institutions he has led have excelled by focusing on the ethical as well as the technical, offering record levels of scholarships for students and emphasizing college affordability, launching numerous academic programs, centers, and institutes, endowing nationally recognized faculty, initiating international programs and partnerships, growing campuses and building or renovating campuses, learning and living environments, and raising necessary funds. An avid fundraiser, his team tripled his last institution's endowment and raised the highest total in institutional history for student scholarships, endowed professorships, and campus infrastructure. A devout Catholic, Dr. Nair and his wife, the former Kelly McIntyre, have four children, Evelyn, Charlie, Henry, and Hadley. Please join me in welcoming the 21st president of Seton Hall, Dr. Joseph E. Nyer. Members of the faculty and the university at large, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I hope you are well and looking forward to an outstanding academic year, a year that will undoubtedly be like no other. It's hard to believe how much has changed since our last convocation. Just over a year ago, you warmly welcomed my family and me to this remarkable community. Here we found a strong institution with robust academics, a hardworking and diverse student body, a distinctive and evident Catholic identity, a storied past, rich presence, and promising future. But more than that, I found a community united by a sense of mission, and evolving shared priorities. Throughout its history, Seton Hall has shown remarkable resilience in the face of adversity and a genuine willingness to embrace change. These qualities which you model for our students every day are propelling us from excellence to distinctive eminence among the nation's leading universities. Since 1856, Seton Hall has delivered its Catholic educational mission through wars, economic depressions, political and social upheaval, and even pandemics. Of course, we are living through a period of tremendous adversity and seismic change right now. In March, our community entered a period of disruption unlike any in the last hundred years. Let me thank you again for your exceptional work since the virus arrived on our shores. You adapted to circumstances that change daily often by the hour. You went above and beyond to serve our students in ways that were, that were unimaginable even seven months ago. Well before any government guidance, together we deployed measures to protect students, faculty, clergy, and our employees, our community. 
We were among the first to cancel study abroad programs throughout the world, regardless of location. And in the midst of an unfortunately timed spring break, we moved to reduce density, begin social distancing, transition instruction to remote settings, and safely move the vast majority of our students out of the residence halls. This was before guidance to do so. And at the request of state officials, we then prepared several of our residence halls for use by the healthcare system. Thankfully, our heroes in healthcare persevered and the campus was not needed. Why did we take these actions? Because together we knew it was the right thing to do for the health and safety of our community. And because time was of the essence, even though we knew such actions would create financial hardships. Despite the advancing pandemic, you stayed focused. You rolled up your sleeves and you were there for our students and the university. With your assistance, we established working groups, teams and committees to provide advice and input in university decision making. Preserving the faculty voice is vital to Seton Hall. Now, some will say that there's been too, there's been too much input. Others will say there's not been enough input. But I know that history will show that you were there when Seton Hall needed you most. You were even there when we had to make difficult financial decisions. You helped ensure that this year's budget promoted the health and well-being of the entire community. You ensured that budget advanced college affordability by investing in enhanced funding for student scholarships and student grants. You help ensure that this year's budget invests in academic quality. And you helped ensure that we continue to focus on rebalancing the instructional and non-instructional expenses by focusing on reductions on the later. The budget decisions were not easy and many people and families have been affected. In addition to freezing major non-COVID related capital and related expenditures, we froze travel, we had operational budget reductions, and any employee making more than $50,000 a year was impacted. Just for example, we had tiered salary reductions. We have a temporary reduction in 403B contributions. We deployed a furlough program affecting 145 administrators and staff members. And we unfortunately needed to lay off one in 10 staff and administrators. Your cooperation in keeping our community safe, advising on the difficult decisions, delivering remote instructions, and helping plan our return has been often selfless and inspiring. And you continue to be there every day ensuring our university fulfills its mission to change destinations and transform the lives of our students. We in higher education, all of us, we're often criticized for being hopelessly resistant to change. And I've shared with you before that my friend often tells me it's easier to go back and change the course of history than it is to change a history course. Well, he no longer says that about higher ed. Seton Hall is among the institutions that have led and continues to lead. Thanks to strong faculty input, we were early to announce fall plans, the root of which have been widely adopted within and beyond the higher education sector. We could not have reached this point without the tireless efforts of many of you on this call. Faculty members were leaders in creating and evaluating models in contingency planning and ultimately in helping form our restart plan that helped drive our return to campus. Strong faculty input resulted in steadily evolving plans that are rooted in strategy and aligned with our fundamental principles and values. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the extraordinary preparations you and others have made to deliver a combination of remote, hybrid and, and reduced density in-person instruction. Seton Hall's successful start to the year will be a team effort and the university is grateful. Now we fully realize that flexibility was built into our planning efforts. We fully realize we don't know the path of the virus. We recognize that we may need to shift to fully remote instruction depending on what happens with the virus in our part of the country. Looking to the future, 
Our nation is clearly fighting two pandemics and struggling to find a cogent voice and sustained action. COVID-19 has illuminated the cracks and the fissures and the fractures in every sector of our economy, from supply, from supply chain to healthcare, from Wall Street to Main Street, all of this affects our families and our loved ones, and higher education is no different. Meanwhile, thousands of fellow citizens are striving to move our country closer to its highest ideals. The system of oppression that predates the Republic has been exposed to the sun. Thankfully, in the words of former Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Let's be clear, combating two pandemics will require sustained and united action. The pandemics will likely extinguish some universities. The pandemics coupled with internal fighting will likely be the end to many more. Let us avoid both results and focus on the hardest tasks, finding unity over division, sustained action, and a successful path forward. We know there are challenges. We believe there are going to be immense price pressures and price elasticity issues in both public and private higher education. We know that public and private universities will suffer due to frozen appropriations and future budget reductions. Private institutions are likely going to struggle a little bit more. For example, New Jersey recently announced that it would distribute $149 million of federal stimulus funds to New Jersey's public universities and only $1 million across the 14 private institutions. We must do better. Seton Hall and our peers will contend with families who are evaluating with even greater focus the value of private higher education. And we know fundraising will be increasingly difficult. But what concerns me the most is reflected in Jonathan's remarks. I'm deeply concerned about the sustained economic impact unemployment rates, family saving rates, and what this means for access to higher education, particularly for Pell Grant recipients, lower income families, and the steadily disappearing middle class. So what do we do? First, we protect and support each other. We advance college affordability and college access. We continue to rebalance our instructional and non-instructional expenses. We identify and make key investments in academic quality and the student experience on all of our campuses. We uphold our Catholic mission and we strive for a more just and equitable country. We carefully examine the structure of our schools and colleges. We advance our financial recovery and we launch our long awaited fundraising campaign. I continue to remind our teams who are working so diligently that the measure of our integrity is not how we show up on our best days, but rather how we rally together on our most difficult ones. I'm confident Seton Hall will emerge on the other side of these dark days, shining a bright light on the possibilities for the future. I believe we will discover new ways to provide a powerful education rooted in our Catholic mission and intellectual tradition. I also know that we will never use the pandemic as an excuse for lowering our expectations. I don't have to tell you that this will be a year like no other. Seton Hall will call on you to serve our students in new and vital ways. It will be a demanding year, one that will tease out greater excellence in all of us. And it will be an exciting year, filled with the promise of achieving goals that are unique in Seton Hall history. Through it all, we will continue to make decisions rooted in faculty input and shared governance. There is much work ahead. Yet I know you will do your utmost to uphold the promise of a transformative higher education at our university. You always have. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless Seton Hall University. Thank you, President Nair. At this point in the program, we will invite the deans to recognize their faculty promotions and tenure, and also introduce our new faculty. Allow me now to welcome the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Peter Shoemaker.
Good evening. It is my pleasure to recognize our faculty members for promotion to professor. Kiju Casey Choi, PhD, Department of Religion. Dr. Choi works in the area of theological ethics and is the author of Discipline by Race, Theological Ethics and the Problem of Asian American Identity. This well-received monograph focuses on the ambivalent nation, nature of Asian uh, racial identity in an America where the white-black dichotomy has historically defined mainstream understandings of race. His classes garner rave reviews with students calling him a wow instructor, and he has served the university in numerous capacities, including departmental chair. Tin Chun Tina Chu, PhD, Department of Biological Sciences. Dr. Chu is a microbiologist with a background in genomics. She has published dozens of articles in several areas, including the use of natural products such as green tea extract as antimicrobial agents, the study of algal blooms, molecular probes for microbial detection, and the endometrial, endometrial microbiome in IVF. This research agenda has been supported by numerous grants where she has been the principal investigator as or co-investigator. She is popular with students and she is one of the founders of Seton Hall's class-based undergraduate research program in genomics. Beyond the walls of Seton Hall, Dr. Chu is involved in the community as a member, as a mentor for high school students. Our new colleagues in the College of Arts and Sciences are Shajina Anand, PhD, Anna University, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, and Heather S. Lee, PhD, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work, and Criminal Justice. I would also like to acknowledge three emeriti faculty, Dr. Jeffrey Gray, Department of English. A specialist in American literature, Dr. Gray has a distinguished record of publication, including eight books and 30 articles. This work includes monographs published by the University of Georgia and Yale University Presses, as well as commentary and highly visible publications, such as MLA Professions and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Dr. Gray has enhanced the cultural life of Seton Hall by bringing writers, jazz musicians, and others to campus. Dr. Pakwa Edwin Leung, Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. Dr. Leung is a distinguished scholar of Asian history, politics, and culture who has written 30 books and his articles total more than 50. He has won numerous awards for his scholarship and leadership in Asian studies within and outside the university. Most notably, he's the recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, a prestigious award whose prior recipients include Nobel Prize winners. And lastly, Dr. Thomas Marlowe, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. Dr. Marlowe is a specialist in the area of applied mathematics and computer science. Remarkably, he has authored nearly 100 referee publications, a textbook, numerous conference publications, and several successful grants. He's a Renaissance man with broad interests who has presented on Bernard Lonergan and has taught in the university core. He tells me that he is not slowing down, so get prepared for what's next. Next uh, on, on the virtual podium um, is uh, my colleague, Dean Joyce Strausser from the Stillman School of Business. Thank you, Peter. I am so proud to congratulate my colleague, Pamela Adams, Associate Professor in the Department of Management, who earned tenure this year. Pamela's work perfectly personifies our Stillman mission goal of transforming concepts into business practice. She's an engaging teacher who builds real business applications into every class she teaches. She has published scholarly work in the top journals in her field, but she also collaborates with student entrepreneurs on articles that are published in more practice related journals. Bottom line, she's exactly the type of faculty member to whom you want to make a lifetime commitment. Pamela, congratulations and thank you. I am equally proud of the new faculty members who will be joining our Stillman family. These are Javier Farfan. Javier earned his MBA from New York University Stern School of Business and his MA from Columbia University. He will be joining our Department of Marketing. Ruchin Consul earned his MBA from New York University, also from the Stern School of Business. He joins us in the Department of Management, and he also becomes the Associate Director of Stillman's Gerald P. Buscino Center for Leadership Development. Daniel Crevis earned his MBA from Boston College. Dan joins us in the Department of Accounting and Taxation as the Director of Graduate Accounting Programs. Jay Leibowitz 
earned his doctorate in science from George Washington University and joins our Department of Computing and Decision Sciences. Andrew Schwartz earned his PhD from California Berkeley and joins our Department of Finance. And finally, joining us in January is Danielle Sanzaleri. Danielle earned her doctorate from Clemson University and will join our Department of Economics and Legal Studies. But I should tell you that her most impressive degree won't appear on that slide. Danielle earned her Bachelor of Business Administration from the Stillman School of Business, majoring in both economics and finance. So we look forward to welcoming Danielle home to the hall in January. Welcome on behalf of all of Seton Hall to our new colleagues in the Stillman School of Business. And it is now my honor to recognize and invite to the podium Dean Deirdre Yates, the founding dean of the College of Communication and the Arts. Thank you, Dean Strausser, and good afternoon to everyone. It is my honor to recognize one of the highly distinguished faculty from the College of Communication and the Arts, who has most deservedly been promoted to the rank of professor. Dr. Jonathan Krzyzewski, AKA Dr. K, holds international recognition and acclaim in his field of media studies. Uh, just last year, I was doing a presentation at the University of Pulaski in the Czech Republic. And when I finished my presentation, a gentleman came running up to the podium. I was thinking that perhaps he was coming to congratulate me on my presentation. But in actuality, he was coming to say, do you really know Dr. Krzyzewski? Do you really work with Dr. Krzyzewski? <laughs> so, yes, I said, to which he was completely amazed. So it was nice to know the impression that I made and very nice to know the impression that you make, Dr. Krzyzewski. I thank you and congratulate you, John. And thank you for all that you bring to our college. Uh, on a new note, I am delighted to welcome to the College of Communication and the Arts community of artists and scholars, our newest faculty member, Dr. McKenna Schrey, who holds her PhD from Seton Hall and is joining our public relations program. A very warm, heartfelt welcome to you, Dr. Shrey. And we are very fortunate to have three of our retired faculty who have been granted the honor of Professor Emeritus status. And they are Dr. Petra Chu from our art history program, Dr. Earl Kenneth Hoffman from our art design and interactive multimedia program, and Dr. Christopher Sharrett from our media and film studies program. Congratulations to all of the faculty in the College of Communication and the Arts. And now, I am happy to introduce my colleague, Dr. Courtney Smith, Acting Dean of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations, who will introduce his faculty. Dean Smith. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to recognize a new faculty member joining the School of Diplomacy. Uh, David Wood earned his MA at the University College in London. He joins our Center for Peace and Conflict Studies as a grant funded professor of practice who's doing research in the Middle East and North Africa and teaching in negotiation and peacemaking. David, welcome to your new role and congratulations. It is now my pleasure to pass the podium to Dr. Maureen Gillette, who is the Dean of the College of Education and Human Services. Dr. Gillette, your mic is muted. So Burke told me it would be an embarrassment if he had to say that <laughs> sentence to anyone, and there it was me today on Friday night after a long week and a longer one to come. I'd first like to welcome Dr. Jason Burns. Uh, we're thrilled to have Jason in the Department of Educational Leadership Management and Policy in K-12 Leadership. He completed his PhD at Michigan State University where he has been a postdoctoral fellow for the last two years. Second on our list is Jennifer Casey. Jennifer is joining our Department of Educational Studies 
He had a long and illustrious 30-year career as a teacher in Cranford Public Schools, and she will be teaching our students special ed. In 2010, Jennifer was named the Cranford Teacher of the Year. Next is Dr. Alan Groveman. Dr. Groveman is joining the Department of Professional Psychology and Marriage and Family Therapy. He earned his PhD from the University of Missouri, and he has had a long career in private practice and um, is a specialist in relational emotive therapy. Uh, Dr. Min Sun Lee, who may be familiar to some of you, earned her PhD at the State University of New York at Albany. She is rejoining the Professional Psychology and Marriage and Family Therapy Department. She stepped away from Seton Hall uh, on this campus for uh, a little while to join the Hackensack University School of Medicine. And uh, this year came back through our hiring process and we are thrilled to have her back within our ranks. Next is Dr. Hillary Morgan. Hillary is joining the Department of Educational Leadership Management and Policy. Hillary earned her PhD at Seton Hall University, and we are thrilled to have Hillary on our faculty. Finally, Dr. Jennifer Timmer, who completed her PhD at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, is joining the Department of Educational Leadership Management and Policy. Jennifer just completed a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Vanderbilt University. And so we are really happy to have Jennifer joining us. A huge welcome to all of our new faculty in the College of Education and Human Services. Next up, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Brian Schulman from the School of Health and Medical Sciences. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dean Gillette. The School of Health and Medical Sciences is pleased to recognize two faculty who were recently promoted. Our first faculty member is Dr. Michael LaFontaine, who joined Seton Hall University in the fall of 2011. His primary teaching responsibilities have been in the subject areas of physiology and pharmacology. His research focuses on the medical and clinical consequences of neurological injuries on autonomic nervous system regulation of cardiovascular and endocrine function. His concussion research is performed at Seton Hall through an active collaboration with the Center for Sports Medicine and Department of Athletics. He is entering the final year of an approximate $525,000 research grant funded through the New Jersey Commission on Brain Injury Research. His spinal cord injury research is performed in the Spinal Cord Injury Research Center at the Bronx VA Medical Center and through collaborations at the Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation. These efforts and many others in persons with spinal cord injury have been supported by more than $16.5 million of research grants. These studies have also served as a backdrop for research projects with more than 50 students from our Doctor of Physical Therapy and Master of Science in Athletic Training programs. Dr. LaFontaine has published more than 50 peer-reviewed publications and has delivered more than 70 presentations at different scientific conferences around the world. Congratulations, Dr. LaFontaine, on your promotion to full professor. Our second faculty member promoted is Dr. Sona Patel. She joined the faculty in 2014 and received her first federal grant less than six months later on a $380,000 project that examined the neural mechanisms underlying voice problems in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Patel also collaborates with Johns Hopkins University on a multi-million dollar grant that examines the cognitive and neurological recovery of emotional tone of voice after stroke. This research is the first to perform longitudinal investigations of right hemisphere stroke involving extensive brain imaging combined with speech recordings, which allows one to see the extent of spontaneous recovery and identify the optimal points for neurological and speech interventions, the directions of future work. Dr. Patel continues to work collaboratively with our partners in neurology and geriatrics at Hackensack Marine and Health and colleagues in the School of Health and Medical Sciences on the submission of larger federal grant applications in each of these areas. Congratulations, Dr. Patel, on your promotion to associate professor. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome four new colleagues to the School of Health and Medical Sciences. 
Amy Gotash, MS, George Washington University, joins our Department of Physician Assistant. Zhu T. Lin, also known as Ray, PhD, Georgia Institute of Technology, joins our Department of Physical Therapy. Jerry Monaco, Doctor of Physical Therapy, Arcadia University, joins our Department of Physical Therapy. And last but certainly not least, Tiffany Fiore, MS from Pace University, joins our Department of Physician Assistant. On behalf of all of us in the School of Health and Medical Sciences and Seton Hall University, congratulations to our promoted faculty and our four new faculty colleagues. At this point, I will turn today's program over to my colleague, the Dean of the Law School, Kathleen Buzang. Dean, your mic is muted. It, it's not. <laughs> I'll start over. Good afternoon. The law school is proud to introduce you to two of our newest colleagues. First, coming to us, to us with tenure is Richard Winchester, who earned his JD at Yale Law School. And second, joining us to begin his academic career is Andrew Mechu, who earned his JD at the University of Chicago Law School. And now I turn the program over to the Dean of University Libraries, Dr. John Bushman, who will recognize his faculty. Thank you, Dean Buzang. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce the newly promoted um, associate professor with tenure, uh, Professor Lisa DeLuca. Uh, professor DeLuca very successfully built a vigorous research program out of her master's in public administration from Seton Hall. Next, um, the University Libraries is very happy to welcome a new faculty member, Ms. Chelsea Barrett, who comes to us with an MBA from Felician University and a more recent Master of Information in Library Science from Rutgers. She is our primary connection to the Stillman School of Business. I will now turn over the podium to Dean Marie Foley from the College of Nursing. Thank you, John. Um, I would like to announce our faculty member who achieved faculty emeritus status this year. That is Dr. Marianne Scharf. Dr. Scharf came to the College of Nursing in September of 1972 and retired after 46 years of service in the university in May of 2018. Dr. Scharf was a very early adopter of computer assisted instruction in the College of Nursing and served as the director of originally our skills lab in 2003, which then became our skill and simulation lab until 2016. In this position, she was very instrumental in securing several grants to purchase both high and low fidelity simulation mannequins. And we are very thankful for Dr. Sharp's contribution to our students and our faculty and are happy to know she's enjoying her retirement, traveling and visiting her children and grandchildren in Texas, hopefully not recently, however. Um, so now I would like to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Brad Henry, who will introduce the new faculty from the Department of Military Sciences. Dr. I mean, Lieutenant Colonel Henry. Thank you, Dean Foley. Uh, we have uh, four new uh, cadre members here in the RTC, uh, RTC department. Uh, first is uh, Captain Cordell Lane. Uh, he's coming to us where, uh, from, the, from Georgia Tech where he just earned his master's in engineering. Uh, he's a West Pointer uh, engineering degree and he's an engineer officer. So he'll be teaching our juniors and getting them ready to go to summer camp. Uh, next, we have Master Sergeant Adam Laws. Uh, he's the new senior military science instructor. Uh, he's the senior enlisted a uh, cadre member in the program. Uh, comes for us from Fort Bliss, Texas, uh, where he just got done as a company first sergeant, and uh, he has an associate's degree from Central Texas College. Next is Sergeant First Class Carlos Padilla. He's an infantryman uh, by trade. He comes to us from the 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii. Uh, he's currently working on his uh, bachelor's at Western Kentucky University, and he'll be instructing our sophomores. 
And then finally, Captain Rocky Rodriguez uh, earned his bachelor's from Thomas Edison State University. Uh, he'll be working with uh, our human resources uh, assistant uh, to take care of uh, the numerous administrative tasks that we have for our cadets. Uh, he is also our New Jersey National Guard uh, officer and liaison. So he helps us with uh, a tremendous amount of uh, support and, 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 and issues that we have with the, the Jersey National Guard, which has only been highlighted with the COVID uh, with the COVID issues that have been going on with the state. We've had a lot of cadets that have been uh, called, to, called to duty to uh, support the COVID. So Captain Rodriguez will be helping us out with that. Uh, we now welcome back our master of ceremonies, uh, Richard Winchester. Welcome to all the new faculty and congratulations to those who have received promotion and tenure and newly awarded emeritus faculty. Uh, once again, I invite Dr. Farina to read the citation for the 2020 Albert Hakeem Faculty Service Award. Thank you, Richard. As chair of the Faculty Senate, I am pleased to continue the tradition of presenting the Faculty Service Medal in the name of the faculty at our annual faculty convocation. The Senate resolution that established this award in 1998 states, this honor shall be bestowed upon a full-time South Orange faculty member for giving copiously of his or her time, energy, and personal gifts to advance the status and interests of the faculty and thereby of the academic mission of the university. As a tribute to Dr. Albert Hakem and through a faculty Senate resolution, in 2008, the Faculty Service Medal was renamed the Albert Hakem Faculty Service Medal. It is my pleasure to announce that the 2020 Albert Hakem Faculty Service Medal recipient is Dr. Nathaniel Knight, professor from the College of Arts and Sciences. Congratulations, Nathaniel. Today, we also want to honor the man for whom the Faculty Service Medal is named, Dr. Al Hakem. Ironically, Al never received the award himself since it was created after he retired from the university. In recognition of our enduring gratitude for his extraordinary service to the faculty, however, the Faculty Senate has voted to correct this oversight and recognize Dr. Hakem with the Faculty Service Medal. While he could not be with us today, we hope you will join us in a round of applause for a man who is a model of selfless service, collegiality, and servant leadership at Seton Hall for 62 years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farina, and congratulations to Dr. Knight and Dr. Hakem. I would like to thank everyone who brought this program together, especially the members of the Faculty Convocation Planning Committee who worked tirelessly to make this program possible. It is tradition that we conclude the Faculty Convocation by singing the alma mater. Please enjoy the University Choir conducted by Dr. Jason Tram. Thank you and hazard Zet forward. <laughs> 